existence. Actually, I've written it down conveniently because I don't speak Greek, but I have. Get out of my way, squid. I have an entire. No! So we have here Gaddafi's Green Book. The Green Book of Muammar Gaddafi. Solution of the problem of democracy, the authority of the people, the solution of the economic problem, socialism, the social basis of the third universal. Well, I think I want to check out that one first. I don't know about you, but third universal theory sounds intriguing. Gaddafi's Green Book, section three, the social basis of the third universal theory. What are the first and second universal theories? The social factor, the national factor, is the dynamic force of human history. The social bond, which binds together human communities from the family through the tribe to the nation, is the basis for the movement of history. Heroes in history are, by definition, those who have sacrificed for causes. But what causes? They sacrifice for the sake of others. But which others? They are those with whom they maintain a relationship. Therefore, the relationship between an individual and a group is a social one that governs the people's dealings amongst themselves. Nationalism, then, is the base upon which one nation emerges. That just came completely out of... What? What? Therefore, the relationship between an individual and a group is a social one that governs the people's dealings amongst themselves. Nationalism, then, is the base upon which one nation emerges. But that doesn't make any sense. How can a nationalism be the base upon which one nation emerges? Of what is is it a nationalism? What does that have to do with any of the aforementioned? This actually seems kind of the reverse. The nation would seem to be the basis upon which a nationalism emerges. Because you need these relationships in order to give rise to the, the governing of the people's dealings amongst themselves. Oh, no. We're reading maps of meaning again, aren't we? Oh, no. Oh, no, this is going to suck. This is going to suck so much. Social causes are therefore national. And the national relationship is a social one. The social relationship is derived from society, i.e., the relationship among members of one nation. The social relationship is therefore a national relationship and the national is a social relationship. Okay, hang on. I need to write this out. This is like aneurysm inducing. Oh my god. Okay, so let's 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 make this make sense. Okay, so heroes. Okay, so, so Heroes sacrifice for those they're in a relationship with. Therefore, the relationship between an individual and a group is a social one that governs the people's dealings amongst themselves. Therefore, relationship between people is a social one. But, but what does the social mean? How does this make it therefore? There's no connection between these two. Three. Nationalism then is the base upon which one nation emerges. What? But, but, but why? Why? We're going to need more, more for this. Okay. So, and, and then we press on. The social relationship is derived from society, i.e. the relationship among members of one nation. But we just said that nationalism is the basis of a nation. And nationalism is the basis of a, of a nation because the relationship between people is a social one. That being the case, how can social relationships derive from members of a nation if it's the social relationship that makes it so that nationalism is the basis of it. What? I don't understand. Scalp massager. All right. Okay. 
Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, we've got heroes. Heroes in history are those who have sacrificed for those whom they're in a relationship with. Therefore, nationalism is the base upon which one nation emerges. Okay, we're going to move on. We have to. Even if small in number, communities or groups form one nation regardless of the individual relationship amongst its members. But that's the opposite of what you just said. That's the opposite of what you just said. You just... Regardless of the individual relationship amongst its members, you just said... The relationship between an individual and a group is a social one that governs the people's dealings amongst themselves. Nationalism is their... Nationalism is, is, nationalism is then the base upon which one nation emerges. Social causes are therefore national because of the relationships amongst individuals and a group. What is meant here by a community is that which is permanent because of the common national ties that govern it. Oh my god. Okay. Historic movements are mass movements. Uh... The movement of one group, i.e. the movement of one group in its own interests, differentiated from the interests of other communities. These differentiations indicate the social characteristics that bind a community together. Mass movements are independent movements to assert the identity of a group conquered or oppressed by another group. The struggle for authority happens within the group itself, down to the level of the family, as was explained in part one of The Green Book. The political axis of the third universal theory. I guess we need to go back to section one to understand this. I will I will finish the next two pages of this section, then we'll go back. You need to know the beginning to know the end. The group movement is a nation's movement for its own interests. By virtue of its national structure, each group has common social needs which must be collectively satisfied. These needs are in no way individualistic. They are collective needs, rights, demands, or objectives of a nation which are linked by a single ethos. That is why these movements are called national movements. But you, you didn't actually explain why they're called national movements. You just said they're, that's what a nation is. Contemporary national liberation movements are themselves social movements. They will not come to an end before every group is liberated from the domination of another group. The world is now passing through one of the regular cycles of the movement of history, Namely, the social struggle in part in support of nationalism. Okay, so basically there's something sort of a watered-down Marxist position being staked out here. Namely that there's kind of a mutually assured nationalism taking place in which nationalism becomes sort of like statism, etc., etc., becomes a condition of survival or a condition of play within the prevailing system. Therefore, given that it confers a necessary uh, material advantage over those who aren't playing it, um, you can't have a dissolution of an international system of national states or whatever, um, without the system itself coming down equally across the board. Something like that. Which is fine. It's not actually a dumb point. In the world of man, this is as much a historical reality as it is a social reality. That means that the national struggle, the social struggle, is the basis of the movement of history. It is stronger than all the other factors, since it is in the nature of the human group, it is in the nature of the nation, it is the nature of life itself. Other animals apart from man live in groups. Indeed, just as the community is the basis for the survival of all groups in the animal kingdom, so nationalism is the basis for the survival of nations. Yeah, but why not all the other forms of association we've had before nations? Nations are not ubiquitous historically. Nations whose nationalism is destroyed are subject to ruin. Minorities, which are minorities, which are one of the main political problems in the world, are the outcome. What, what about those nationalisms which, which are the rule of a minority over a majority? They are nations whose nationalism has been destroyed and which are thus torn apart. The social factor is therefore a factor of life, a factor of survival. It is the nation's innate momentum for survival. Na nationalism in the human world and group instinct in the animal kingdom are like gravity in the domain of material and celestial bodies. If the sun lost its gravity, its gases would explode and its unity would no longer exist. That's such a silly statement on multiple levels. Um... That's just such a silly statement. Um, historically, for the longest time, um, unless they themselves were targeted for extermination or enslavement, peasants, slave classes, etc., etc., general denizens of a region would not really have much attachment to the actual rulers of a place, or even the ruling peoples of a place, if such existed. Um, nationalism is not like gravity in the human world. Nationalism is a 
condition of play in a global state system that only legally recognizes nation groups as having a right to exist or things like that. And so it becomes a kind of normative defense and you can establish the general belief in the existence of a national identity against its extermination. The national factor, the social bond, works automatically to appel a nation towards survival, in the same way that the gravity of an object works to keep it up as one mass surrounding its center. The dissolution and dispersion of atoms in an atomic bomb are the result of the explosion of the nucleus, which is the focus of gravitation for the particles around it. When the factor of... I mean, that's funny. I used the phrase mutually assured nationalism earlier. When the factor of unity in those component systems is destroyed and gravity is lost, every atom is separately dispersed... This is the nature of matter. It is an established natural law. To disregard it or to go against it is damaging to life. Similarly, man's life is damaged when he begins to disregard nationalism, the social factor, for it is the gravity of the group, the secret of its survival. Only the religious factor is a rival to the social factor in influencing the unity of a group. Well, we've just been talking about a Jewish state for the longest time. Now, there's an ethnic component to that, or at the very least it's been conflated with an ethnic component, and people have been barred access to Israeli citizenship on ethnic grounds, but that is fundamentally a religious unity. So, that's a religious unity giving rise to an ethnic group. Like giving rise to an ethnic group in the sense of a, a citizenry, or the body of like a nation-state. However, the religious factor may divide the national group or unite groups with different nationalisms. However, the social factor will eventually triumph. This has been the case throughout the ages. Historically, each nation had a religion. This was harmonious. Eventually, however, differences arose, which became a genuine cause of conflict and instability in the lives of people throughout the ages. This is also just a historically silly statement. Um, how about the immense ethnic diversity of places like Britain, which has basically collapsed in favor of religious, non-religious identities, and so on and so forth. Like, there's a massive diversity in Europe of different ethnic and cultural groups that have much more of a, um, much more of a strictly ethnic, uh, dimension than, than, than otherwise. But these all have faded in favor of different types of identity, including the national, which is also similarly abstract. Yeah, this is a dumb analogy. I am so confused by this. A sound rule is that each nation should have a religion, for it, to be, for it to be otherwise is abnormal. For such an abnormality, that's almost a Rousseauian point, for such an abnormality creates an unsound situation which becomes a real cause for disputes within one national group. There is no other solution but to be harmonious with the natural rule, i.e. each nation has a single religion. When the social factor is compatible with the religious factor, harmony prevails, and the life of communities becomes stable, strong, and develops soundly. Marriage is a process, just jumping into marriage randomly, Marriage is a process that can positively or negatively influence the social factor. Though on a natural basis of freedom, both man and woman are free to accept whom they want and reject whom they do not want, marriage within a group, by its very nature, strengthens its unity and brings about collective growth and conformity with the social factor. So we're switching into the family now. Um, actually, this brings up a good occasion to bring up something a little bit more lucidly written. There we go. All right. That's why it's so hot in here. So here we have Rousseau's... Boom. Okay, here we go. You can't read this, but it's the, it's the, it's the idea. It's the idea that matters. So this is chapter 8 of the civil religion. Men at first had no other kings than the gods, nor any other government than the theocratic one. They reasoned as had Caligula... And at the time they reasoned correctly. It takes a long adulteration of sentiments and ideas before one can bring oneself to accept a being like oneself as one's master and flatter oneself into believing one will be well off as a result. From this alone, that god was placed at the head of each political society. It followed that there were as many gods as peoples. Two peoples, strangers to one another, and almost always enemies, could not long recognize the same master. Two armies engaged in battle could not obey the same chief. Thus, from national divisions resulted polytheism and from it, theological and civil intolerance, which are naturally the same, as will be stated below. 
The Greeks' fancy of rediscovering their gods among barbarian peoples came from their fancy of also regarding themselves these peoples' natural sovereigns. But the erudition that nowadays focuses on the identity of various nations' gods is quite ridiculous, as if Moloch, Saturn, and Cronus could be the same god, as if the Phoenician's Baal and the Greeks' Zeus and the Latin's Jupiter could be the same, as if chimerical beings bearing different names could have anything in common. Even if the question arises about how it is that under paganism, where every state had its cult and its gods, there were no wars of religion, I reply that it was precisely because each state, with its own cult as well as its government, did not distinguish between its gods and its laws. Political war was also theological. The departments of the gods were, so to speak, set by the boundaries of nations. The god of one people had no right over other peoples. The gods of the pagans were not jealous gods. They divided the empire of the world among themselves. Moses himself and the Hebrew people sometimes countenanced this idea by speaking of the god of Israel. They did, it is true, regard as not the gods of the Canaanites, prescribed peoples destined for destruction, and whose stronghold they were to occupy. But see how they spoke about the divinities of the neighboring peoples they were forbidden to attack. The possession of what belongs to Chamos, or Camos, your god, Jephthah said to the Ammonites. Is it not legitimately your due? By the same title we possess lands our victorious god has acquired. This, it seems to me, indicates a clearly acknowledged parity between the rights of Chamos and those of the God of Israel. But when the Jews, subjected to the kings of Babylon and subsequently to the kings of Syria, obstinately sought to recognize no other God than their own, this refusal, viewed as a rebellion against the victor, brought down on them the persecutions about which one reads in their history, and of which there is no other known example prior to Christianity. Since then, each religion was tied exclusively to the laws of the state that prescribed it. There was no other way to convert a people than to enslave it. Nor were there any other missionaries than conquerors, and since the obligation to change their cult was the law of the vanquished, it was necessary to be victorious before talking about conversion. Far from men fighting for the gods, it was, as in Homer, the gods who fought for men. Each asked his own for victory and paid for it with new altars. The Romans, before taking a stronghold, called upon its gods to abandon it, and when they let the people of Tarantum keep their irate gods, they did so because in this case they regarded those gods as subject to their own and forced the and uh, forced to pay them homage. They left the vanquished gods. They left the vanquished their gods as they left them their laws. Often the only tribute they exacted was a crown dedicated to Capitoline Jupiter. Here we go. There remains then the religion of man or Christianity. He's been talking about different kinds of religion. He's a typology of three kinds. Uh there remains then the religion of man or Christianity, not that of today, but that of the gospel, which is altogether different. By this saintly, sublime, genuine religion, men and children of the same God all recognize one another as brothers, and the society that unites them does not dissolve even at death. But this religion, since it has no particular relation to the body politic, leaves the laws with only the force they derive from themselves, without adding any other force to them, and hence, one of the great bonds of any particular society remains without effect. What is more, far from attaching the citizens' hearts to the state, it detaches them from it as from all earthly things. I know of nothing more contrary to the social spirit. So essentially, the uh, the case um, that Gaddafi is making here uh, is essentially a Rousseauian one. What he's basically saying is that you need a religion at the level of a, a community worship that keeps, that maintains and sustains and wards off the kind of uh, social bond breaking tendency of religions of man, so to speak, in Rousseau's language, um, that cause a general dissociation from the local and an attachment to something more abstract in general. Um, so when he says a sound rule is that each nation should have a religion for it to be otherwise as abnormal, uh, creates an unsound situation which becomes a real cause for disputes within one, one national group. Um, that's essentially the point he's making. This is actually not ridiculous logic um it's it's highly essentialist logic but you know is some of the theory money going towards a camera with a higher resolution soon okay that's that's a big expense like the the money is going to a big pool that pays for me to live and pays for me to keep doing this and then some of it will go as i get a surplus into upgrading the equipment i am going to be prioritizing the desk camera because I'm, I'm using that more frequently all right the solution of the problem of democracy the authority of the people <laughs> okay Press on. The instrument of government is the prime political problem confronting human communities. The problem of this 
of the instrument of government entails questions of the following kind. What form should the exercise of authority assume? How ought societies to organize themselves politically in the modern world? Even conflict within the family is often the result... By the way, this would be... I wish I had my notes on governmentality to hand, because I would have stuff to say about this, but I'd have to retrieve it from way back. Soon. Although, side note. If you were into, interested in uh, questions pertaining to democracy and governmentality, as Rousseau discusses it, you could do far worse than to start with the published lectures by Picador, by Michel Foucault, of the government of self and others. This is a fantastic selection of lectures. Highly recommend. It will also get you really excited to read um, Euripides, of all people. <clears throat> which I have in a gorgeous black leather bound edition that I've never gotten to show off. Only the first volume, unfortunately, but it does come with the play that is the principal subject of Foucault's lectures, which is Ion. But seriously, look how gorgeous this is. Look at this. Look at that foil end page. Ugh. But I digress. Even conflict within the family is often the result of the failure to resolve this problem of authority. It has clearly become more serious with the emergence of modern societies. People today face this persistent question in new and pressing ways. Communities are exposed to the risks of uncertainty and suffer the grave consequences of wrong answers. Yet, none has succeeded in answering, conclu answering it conclusively and democratically. The Green Book presents the ultimate solution to the problem of the proper instrument of government. All political systems in the world today are a product of the struggle for power between alternative instruments of government. This struggle may be peaceful or armed, as is evidenced among classes, sects, tribes, parties, or individuals. The outcome is always the victory of a particular governing structure, be it that of an individual, group, party, or class, and the defeat of the people, the defeat of genuine democracy. Political struggle that results in the victory of a candidate with, for example, 51% of the votes, leads to a dictatorial governing body in the guise of a false democracy, since 49% of the electorate is ruled by an instrument of government they did not vote for, but which has been imposed upon them. This is a basic conflation of the plebiscite with democracy itself. Democracy does not refer to the fact of voting, although one of the mechanisms by which you make a state democratic is by having voting. Um, democracy means simply that the power of the state is downstream from the people as an entity. And so even if you have a situation where you have 49% of the people not voting in the current government, they still assented to the process that selected them. And therefore, they, even in the case that they didn't vote for them, they still assented to that government's rule. So that government still represents them. Why? Because they assented to the process that gave them their position. That put them in place. Um, so it's not a false democracy. Although, it could still be a false democracy if there is something undermining the fact undermining the uh, will or decision of the people as a group from actually being manifest at the end result of that process. And so the existence of plebiscites, even if, for example, they result in 99% approval, can still, uh, can still give the impression of a democracy where there, in fact, is not one. Um, case in point, all, all, of those, all of those highly authoritarian countries where they have such high approval ratings... Um, because you're punished if you, if you do otherwise. Such is dictatorship. Besides, this political conflict may produce... Sorry. Besides, this political conflict may produce a governing body that represents only a minority. For when votes are distributed among several candidates, though one polls more than any other, the sum of the votes received by those who receive fewer votes might well constitute an overwhelming majority. Okay. However, that's a, it's a weird point. However, the candidate with fewer votes wins and his success is regarded as legitimate and democratic. In actual fact, dictatorship is established under the cover of false democracy. This is the reality of the political systems prevailing in the world today. They are dictatorial systems, and it is evident that they, false, that they falsify genuine democracy. 
last sentence may be true, the argument he gives here is not good. Um, the bare fact that you can add up the votes of alternative candidates and arrive at a number greater than 50% or greater than the uh, number that supported the winning candidate does not mean, therefore, that the voting process itself is anti-democratic. Any decision is going to be singular. Any decision by a voted in person is going to be singular. And even if that person had 100% of the vote behind him, he may still, or she may still, as depending on where it is, um, they may still uh, make decisions that the broader base of the voting uh, uh, population does not agree with. Does it cease to be democracy then? No, because they authorize that person's rule. They authorize that person being the bearer of the decision. That's how that works. Um, what's, what's sort of being touched on here a little bit, albeit badly, is that democracy, in fact, does not actually, cannot actually, it's infeasible, result in a continuous flow of the will of the people determining the outcomes of of decision-making authority. Certainly so in modern states, which rely on specialization and complex bureaucracies in order to manage its affairs, um, which are often inscrutable to the general population. So not only can they not have a say in it, lest the whole system break down, they may not even be aware of uh, the decisions that are taking place or have the necessary requisite knowledge to understand the decisions that are taking place. Um, Parliaments are the backbone of that conventional democracy prevailing in the world today. Parliament is a misrepresentation of the people, and parliamentary systems are a false solution to the problem of democracy. A parliament is originally founded to represent the people, but this in itself is undemocratic, as democracy means the authority of the people. No, it doesn't. And not an authority acting on their behalf. It actually means the power of the people. Demos, Kratos. The mere existence... Actually, I've written it down, conveniently. Because I don't speak Greek, but I have... Get out of my way, squid. I have an entire... No! Squiddleton. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, Rick Discovery of Politics. Highly recommend. Christian Meyer. One moment. Spent, uh, spent an entire afternoon just... Writing down all of the Greek terms, which I then promptly forgot. Kratos, strength, success, etc. Kretien, government, governing power. And then, of course, demos. We know what demos means. So it's the it's the power of the people in, in, in general terms, or the force of the people, or the strength of the people, or something like that. That's the closest approximation, anyways. Like that's why they call, that's why they chose the name Kratos in God of War. It's power. It's strength. Um. It is not the authority of the people. Um, there isn't really a distinction between authority and, and power here. Instead, you have the distinction between tyranny and kingship or something like that. Legitimate versus illegitimate rule by power. So tyrants are typically defined as those who rule by power. Typically, the power of the common people, which they use to uh, usurp or overthrow the legitimate authority of uh, ruling elites or, or nobles or whatever. And so one of the interesting things about Greek history is that most of the moves towards democracy were actually facilitated by reforms introduced by tyrants who came to power with the aid of the common folk. Because tyrant does not actually mean dictator or, 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 or crazy fascistic totalitarian ruler, although these weren't nice guys and they did actually rule with an iron fist. Um, it can also mean they who rule by the force of the common people. And so democracy has an intrinsically tyrannical element to it, as more or less, in the classical sense, as more or less all revolutionary movements do, in that they don't rest on institutional legitimization or legitimation, um, legitimacy, that's the word I'm looking for. They don't rest on institutional legitimacy in order to justify their rule or the things that they do. Um... <clears throat> I digress again. A parliament is originally founded to represent the people, but this in itself is undemocratic, as democracy means the authority of the people, no it doesn't, and not an authority acting on their behalf. The mere existence of a parliament means the absence of the people. I mean, they're, they're literal absence, but it's supposed to be representative. In fact, the entire logic is that it means the presence of the people through their personages in the bodies of their representatives in the parliament. 
Parliaments have been a legal barrier between the people and the exercise of authority. There, that's a good point, actually. Um, excluding the masses from meaningful politics and monopolizing sovereignty in their place. That's not a good point um, for this reason. Um, the political class as an area of specialization has caused there to be a general exclusion of common people from engaging in politics at anywhere beyond like sort of a city council level in modern day. However, that is not excluding the masses from meaningful politics categorically and is not the fact of representation that excludes them from meaningful politics. You can't have a direct democracy of a population of millions. It wouldn't work. It doesn't work. One, um, there is a level of knowledge and, and attention that is required to make good decisions given the level of complexity and, and technological complexity and, and uh, sometimes precarity of modern states. And therefore, you need to have people who can both represent and know more than a lot of their constituents. You need people who are able to uh, be a voice for the interests of a group without the cacophony of a group which includes the overwhelming number of people who are not informed, uh, undermining the possibility of any like productive long-term planning or stuff like that. Um, there's flaws in that thinking, but like that's it, it is not itself a use of, an, an undermining of actual democracy or falsifying of democracy. Um, it becomes kind of a, a necessary component of democracy. What's sort of being hit upon here, though, is the intrinsic anti-democratic nature of the state, which rules by uh, specified knowledge that is inaccessible, right? So there's a sense in which, despite the fact that modern states rely upon democratic power to run as they do, there's an anti-democratic element in them in that access to decision-making is exclusive on the basis of specialized knowledge, connections, situation, etc., etc. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Parliaments have been a legal barrier between the people and the exercise of authority, excluding the masses from meaningful politics and monopolizing sovereignty in their place. Strange language. People are left with only a facade of democracy manifested in long queues to cast their election ballot. Okay, sorry. To lay bare the character of parliaments, one has to examine their origin. I thought I had a cough coming, but it stopped. They are either elected from constituencies, a party, or a coalition of parties, or are appointed. But all of these procedures are undemocratic. For dividing the population into constituencies means that one member of parliament represents thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of people, depending on the size of the population. A actually, that's the essence of democracy. Um, the way in which democratic politics was originally facilitated was that you had Cleisthenes redivide the population of Athens into daimoys that cut across familial bounds so that you had new groups that were united solely by mutual interest uh, in terms of their locality, not in terms of bloodline against the interests of other people in their locality. And so you had the death essentially of tribal politics and the emergence of democratic uh, constituencies as the basis of politics going forward. So this is not just incorrect. This is actually the perverse opposite of the actual case. <clears throat> the division of people into constituencies is an essential component of democracy, regardless of the size. It also means that a member keeps few popular organizational links with the electors since he, like other members, is considered a representative of the whole people. That's fair. Um, one of the flaws of representative democracy and one of the reasons why people like Rousseau argue that the ideal size of a state is actually relatively small is that at a certain point, the size of a constituency causes a general alienation of the representative from the people because the people is an amorphous mass too large to actually identify with personally. You identify with a subset of them or an imagined abstraction of them that doesn't actually represent them effectively. <clears throat> this is what the prevailing traditional democracy requires. Rongo. The masses are completely isolated from the representative, and he in turn is totally removed from them. Immediately after winning the electors' votes, the representative takes over the people's sovereignty and acts on their behalf. The prevailing traditional democracy endows the member of parliament with a sacredness and immunity which are denied to the rest of the people. Parliaments, therefore, have become a means of plundering and usurping the authority of the people. It has thus become the right of the people to struggle through popular revolution to destroy such, in such instruments. Such instruments, pardon me. The so-called parliamentary assemblies which usurp democracy and sovereignty and which stifle the will of the people. The masses have the right to proclaim reverberantly the new principle. No representation in lieu of the people. 
so hang on. How do you want? How do you want to make decisions? Then you want to put everything up to a popular vote every single time. Like there's an argument there too. The people as a mass are also uniquely vulnerable to things like moneyed propaganda, and so you can have democracy undermined um, by 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 propaganda campaigns that the average person can't afford to counter. And so if you put everything up to a plebiscite that way, you don't have genuine democracy. Then you you, you simply have the exact same process wherein instead of having uh, masses of people's wills condensed to a single representative who might defy the will of some of its of some of their constituencies, you have masses of people maybe all getting involved, but getting involved under the directive of uh, the the propaganda produced by by powerful individuals or corporations that are also not representative. <clears throat> Because like one of the one of the uh, difficulties of democracy is that the state is also responsible for producing its subjects, and so you have like a fundamental contradiction. Um, can you have a democracy when the state itself also is responsible and imposes uh, responsible for and, and indeed imposes of its of its own accord and its own interests, um, propagandizing to the young, giving them like selecting which types of history or which histories are appropriate to be taught in public schools which ones aren't things of that sort um this is actually interestingly enough a question that comes up a lot in uh discussions of um like his historians who are holocaust deniers um the state has decided that certain narratives are inappropriate to be taught not just incorrect but inappropriate to be taught or heard or to have a platform but they're doing so against obviously those citizens who publish those things and they're, they're in that way, like making a decision that will slant in a good way, but still slant the judgment of the next generation against an idea prior to them understanding it. That's, that's like a, a, an interesting question. Um, it becomes like more interesting as well when you're talking about like uh, pro-democratic uh, propaganda itself. Um, if you're if you're indoctrinating the young to be for democracy, then is, is is it truly a democratic principle that causes them to endorse their democracy later on? Well, not really. It seems to be a top-down authority. Um, this is sort of one of the one of the fundamental flaws of liberalism generally is that it doesn't really take into account time. It it, it treats the state as a system of rules that is responsible for maintaining its own neutrality. Um, but it doesn't take into account, it doesn't account for um, those historical tendencies, the evolution of a people as it interacts with those rules, um, so that you end up in, in contradictory spaces where you have democratic republics um, sort of having to ignore the fact that you have to indoctrinate people as a process of teaching them whatever you end up doing. Whatever they get first is going to inflect what they get later, and, and the reverse is true also, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, in addition to all of this, someone has to make the decision. What is to be taught, what isn't? And someone's going to disagree. And that person's children may be taught by that as well. Yeah. Anywho, <clears throat> if Parliament is formed from one party as a result of its winning an election, it becomes a Parliament of the winning party and not of the people. Except the election was of the people. That's that's the party's not getting. It represents the party and not the people, and the executive power of the Parliament becomes that of the victorious party and not of the people. The same is true. Like, look, this is this is why um, this is why the illegitimacy of the Biden administration was challenged on the grounds that the election was illegitimate. Why? Because the function of an election is to connect the will of the people with the selection of who is in parliament. Therefore, if you assent to the electoral process that gives rise to administration ruling, whether or not it reflects the, uh, the preferences of one part of the constituency, or one part of the democratic voting body over another, um, its decision-making authority was already ratified by you insofar as you ratified the process by which it gained it. And so that's that's purely democratic. 
Now, you may think it, uh, there's a principle in there that's counter to the spirit of democracy in that it still invests a narrow body of narrowly interested people with the absolute decision. But that's a different question. It's still the case that them being vested with that was part of a democratic process. Therefore, it's not fake democracy. It's maybe a structurally problematic democracy. The same is true of the Parliament of Proportional Representation, in which each party holds a number of seats proportional to their success in the popular vote. The members of the Parliament represent their respective parties and not the people, and the power established by such a coalition is the power of the combined parties and not that of the people. By the way, I just want to say how funny this is reading a book by somebody who um, ruled with his family and gave massive amounts of state resources to them. And who was eventually killed by the people as well. The members of the parliament represent their respective parties and not the people, and the power established by such a coalition is the power of the combined parties and not that of the people. Under such systems, the people are the victims whose votes are vied for by exploitative competing factions who dupe the people into political circuses that are outwardly noisy and frantic, but inwardly powerless and irrelevant. Alternatively, the people are seduced into standing in long, apathetic, silent queues to cast their ballots in the same way that they throw waste paper into dustbins. This is the traditional democracy. I can't believe he's actually dissing the the medium on which they write their votes. Like, yeah, you're, I, I, I do indeed put my ballot into a box the same way I put paper into a waste bin. I also, uh, I also use Twitter with the same tools that I write emails and write papers and do my job on on YouTube. This is the traditional democracy prevalent in the whole world, whether it is represented by a one-party, two-party, multi-party, or non-party system. Thus, it is clear that representation is a fraud. Moreover, since the system of elected parliaments is based on propaganda to win votes, it is a demagogic system in the real sense of the word. That's actually a good critique. That's the critique I was making earlier. So, one of the major problems, and this is not undermined by having a a voting representative system um in a world in which uh media space can be bought votes can be bought indirectly because you can then flush the 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 uh the the media space with propaganda privileging one position over another or obscuring one position against another, so that when people go to the polls, they misunderstand the issues, and they vote in line with a logic that does not actually correspond to their own interests, or with reality, or a plutocracy in effect, rule by the rich, as opposed to rule by the demos. By the way, something important to keep, uh, pay attention to when we're talking about like different forms of rule. Democracy is rule, is the power of the people, the demos. Understood strictly as an abstract people, not as an ethnicity, not as a tribe, not as a clique, da 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 When we're talking about things like monarchy, we're talking about who occupies the space of rule, of the decision. So monarchy means one ruler, democracy means from the power of the people. Ergo, and Marx observes this as well, you can have democratic monarchies. Now, the form of government most consistent with the spirit of democracy, or which reflects democracy the most, is going to be some kind of voting republic thing. Or some kind of thing in which pow uh, like authority and decision-making authority is, to the most extent, to the greatest extent possible, dispersed equally amongst the demos. But it is not, therefore, not a democracy if it isn't. And therefore, you can have monarchies that are democratic. You can have republics that are plutocratic. Because even though it still has the republican form, and it's still democratic in a sense, in that it still relies upon the power of the people generally in that abstract sense in order to function and, and to maintain its, its will or whatever. Like, for example, a, a republic that relies upon Hobbesian language but is still nonetheless ruled entirely by the rich in fact. Um, or in the case where there are like property requirements for voting which it can also be a form of rule by the rich, um, it still relies on a democratic logic. Uh, it still relies on the idea that the legitimacy of rule is downstream from the tacit consent of those who it rules, or something like that, um, while still being 
plutocratic and still assuming like you, you, get, you get the idea um so you got to pay attention to those suffixes uh when it's a crassy it means rule by when it's an archy it means who's in charge and these are distinct because who's in charge by what power Moreover, since the system of elected parliaments is based on propaganda to win votes, it is a demagogic system in the real sense of the word. Votes can be bought and falsified, yes. Poor people are unable to compete in the election campaigns, and the result is that only the rich get elected. Yes. Assemblies constituted by appointment or hereditary succession do not fall under any form of democracy. No. That is completely untrue. You can have a hereditary uh, succession or an appointment that is still within a democratic system. It's not a contradiction there. Queen Amidala is not a contradiction. Even though she is an appointed monarch, which is... I, I don't actually know where the democracy takes place there. We never actually see any of the people around in Naboo, but I digress. Philosophers, thinkers, and writers advocated the theory of representative parliaments at a time when peoples were unconsciously herded like sheep by kings, sultans, and conquerors. The ultimate aspiration of the people of those times was to have someone to represent them before such rulers. When even this aspiration was rejected, people waged bitter and protracted struggle to attain this goal. After the successful establishment of the age of the republics and the beginning of the era of the masses, it is unthinkable that democracy should mean the electing of only a few representatives to act on behalf of great masses. This is an obsolete structure. Authority must be in the hands of all the people. The most tyrannical dictatorships the world has known have existed under the aegis of parliaments. Thank you, Muammar Gaddafi. <laughs> um, okay.